If a man accuses another man and charges him with homicide, but cannot bring proof against him, his accuser shall be killed. If a man breaks into a house, they shall kill him and hang him in front of that very breach. So go two of the provisions described in the Louvre Steel, which is better known as the Code of Hammurabi. The Louvre, the most visited art museum in the world and itself a historical monument of France, has the first copy of this text ever discovered on display in room 227. Going in the direction of the nearest staircase, you'll enter room 228 where you'll find a chipped statue of the head of a woman. Turning left into room 229, you'll find this incredible mural of a Lamassu, a winged, man-headed, five-legged bull wearing earrings, which was a protective deity to the Assyrian people. Indeed, the ancient Mesopotamian people were artists, but what I know them best for is their mathematics. Unfortunately, math has never been quite as beloved it as winged and man-headed gods, but like their art, which is on display today in the Louvre, Babylonian mathematics has survived the passage of time as well. Not only because so much of their math was recorded on clay tablets, of which hundreds have survived and been discovered, but some of their actual math, like their place value number system that used base 60, has survived until today. Our modern decimal notation also uses a place value system, where the location of a digit in a number determines which power of 10 it represents. And although we don't use base 60 in our number system, we do use it in our time and in our angles. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and even 360 degrees in a circle. The ancient Babylonians of Mesopotamia were accomplished mathematicians, so it's sad to say that in the Louvre, whether you're in room 227, 228, 229, or any other room with art and artifacts from Mesopotamia, you won't find clay tablet AO6770. It's in their Department of Oriental antiques collection, but sadly is not currently on display in the museum. Thankfully though, the Louvre documents their collection quite well, so although it isn't on public display, we do know what this tablet says. It's a clay tablet dated around 1700 BC that was found in the region of what was once Mesopotamia, but is now Iraq. And it poses the following problem. How long will it take for a sum of money to double if invested at a 20% interest rate compounded annually? And just before we get into the math, I want to remind you that this video is brought to you by my math fashion brand, mathshin.com. This is one of my favorite designs we have available right now, which actually features a backdrop of the ancient city of Babylon. This is on a t-shirt, but you can also get it on a mug or a canvas. This is Tomei's function, which is sometimes called the raindrop function. Hence, here it appears as raindrops, but it's also sometimes called stars over Babylon, hence the Babylon backdrop. In the center, which is difficult to see under these harsh lighting conditions, we have Carl Tomei himself holding an umbrella up against the storm. With this design and the others on mathschen.com, I've really tried to capture the art, beauty, and inspiration that comes from mathematics. Link in the pinned comment and description. Be sure to check it out and pick up some swag if you think it's cool. All right, getting down to the mathematics, this problem is quite trivial to solve with modern methods. A sum of money, P, earning 20% interest compounded annually will be worth 1.2 times p after one year. Remember that 0.2 is 2 tenths or 20%. So this gives us one, the whole amount p, plus that 20% interest. After two years have passed, the sum will have grown to 1.2 to the power of two times p. And in general, after x years have passed, a sum of money p earning 20% interest compounded annually will be worth 1.2 to the power of x times p. And according to the problem on the tablet, we need x so that the sum of money has doubled. Hence, we need this to equal 2 
times p. It's no surprise that at this step, we can cancel the p's from both sides because the initial sum doesn't affect the relative growth rate. And so we are left with this equation to solve, 1.2 to the power of x equals two. Now, some of you may not know how to solve an equation like this because the unknown x is in the exponent. When the unknown is in the base, like x to the power of two equals nine, it's very simple to take the square root on both sides and find that x must be equal to three or being detail oriented, it of course could also be negative three. Getting rid of the exponent to solve for the variable requires roots and radicals. But if we need to get rid of the base to solve for the unknown that's in the exponent, we need something called a logarithm. Specifically, because the base is 1.2, we need the base 1.2 logarithm. If you haven't seen logs before, it is really quite simple, but you need to make sure you're paying attention to the base. For example, the log base two of eight is equal to three. This is because the base of two to the power of three is equal to that input of eight. So you can see if we put eight into the base two logarithm, it takes that base of two away and leaves us with the exponent. Three. If we put 10,000 into the base 10 logarithm, we get an answer of four because that base of 10 to that exponent of four gives us this input of 10,000. An example with the 1.2 base is that the base 1.2 log of 1.44 is equal to two. This is because if we take that base of 1.2 and square it, we get that input of 1.44. And in general, if a base B raised to a power X is equal to A, then the log base B of A gets rid of the base and just gives us the exponent. So that's why we need to use a base 1.2 logarithm in order to solve this equation for X. So we take the base 1.2 log on the left side and take the base 1.2 log on the right side. We're doing the same thing to both sides of the equation. In each case, it will produce the exponent that a base of 1.2 requires to get the input. Of course, a base of 1.2 requires an exponent of x to get this input. So on the left, it just cancels out and gives us x. However, to figure out what exponent 1.2 needs to produce two, we'll need a calculator. Most any scientific calculator will do, but I'm going to use my rare, limited TI-83 plus silver edition. The log function on most calculators by default uses base 10. However, we can convert it by dividing our result by the log of the base we desire. So we'll divide this by the log of 1.2. This gives an answer to five decimal places of 3.80178. We can check our answer by raising 1.2 to this power and confirming that it is very nearly two. So it would take 3.80178 years for the money to double under these circumstances. That's about three years, nine months, and 23 days. That's easy enough, but we've completely abandoned what's on tablet A06770 in the Lou's collection. This tablet shows an answer of 3.7870. It's not as accurate as what we got, but it's off by less than 1%. So how was such an accurate computation achieved by the Babylonians on this clay tablet from 1700 BC? Obviously, Obviously, they didn't have electronic calculators to quickly compute logarithms, but also they didn't even have logarithms at all. Logarithms wouldn't come around until John Napier introduced them in 1614. In the absence of logarithms, the Babylonians employed one of the earliest uses of a method called linear interpolation. This technique takes points from an unknown curve and assumes the curve behaves linearly between them. As long as a curve isn't too curvy between the points being used, it can provide a pretty good approximation. Even today, the technique is commonly used due to its great practicality. To solve the doubling money problem, the Babylonians noticed 1.2 to the three was 1.728, which is less than two. It's too small. But 1.2 to the power of four is 2.0736, which is greater than two. That's too big. 
So the exponent of 1.2 that would produce 2 had to be between 3 and 4. So they're looking for the x-coordinate that produces this point of intersection between the curve 1.2 to the power of x and the horizontal line y equals 2. By using linear interpolation, they will instead find the point of intersection between this black line connecting the two known points and the horizontal line y equals 2. And you can see it's a very good approximation. To emphasize the mathematical concept at play here, I'll use our modern algebraic methods to do the linear interpolation, though the Babylonians didn't use this either, so even this simple interpolation would have been a much more exhausting process. We can easily write the equation of the line through those two known points using point-slope form. For the point x0, y0, we could choose either of these two points we have. Let's say we use the first one. So our line will be something like this. We just need to find the slope. The slope of the line is rise over run, so this minus this divided by this minus this. So this is that familiar slope formula, and this comes up to a slope of 0.3456. So the linear interpolation gives us this line. Remember, x is the duration that the money is invested. It's the number of years that have passed, and we're trying to find x so that y is equal to two. Hence, we'll replace y with two. 2 minus 1.728 is 0 0.272. And on the right side, we're going to want to get x by itself, so why don't we just go ahead and divide both sides by 0.3456 now. So we'll put this over 0.3456. This of course then is equal to x minus 3 since we divided this out. So to finish solving for x, we just need to add 3 to this. Once again, using my limited silver edition TI-83+, plus, we have 3 plus 0.272 divided by 0.3456 producing an answer of 3.7870. And that's how the Babylonians found a solution with well under 1% error to this compound interest problem thousands of years before electronic calculators or logarithms. As a final note, it's worth mentioning how this answer was actually expressed on the clay tablet. Like we mentioned earlier, the Babylonians used a base 60 or sexagesimal number system. So on the tablet, the answer is given as 3, 47, 13, 20, where the 3 represents 3 holes, the 47 represents 47 over 60, the 13 represents 13 over 60 squared, and the 20 represents 20 over 60 cubed. If you add these up on a calculator, you'll see it comes out to 3.7870. Of course, on the tablet, this was written in cuneiform, so it'd look something like this. So that's a math problem that's somewhere in the Louvre. If you know of any other math problems in the Louvre, please do share in the comments. There's something called the Rollin Papyrus in the Louvre, which is a papyrus from Egypt, and apparently shows some usage of large numbers in accounting for bread but I can't find any details on it other than that. Don't forget to check out mathshin.com in the description and in the pinned comment. And if you want to help support what I do, please consider joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to all sorts of fun videos and original music, and it's a big help. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and untuck the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal I Wish to sell my own fake cause I'm jaded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull a prayer Push it all the way through the whole blue planet Faded Psych